So, second talk of this round, we have uh, Dianus Masilunas, uh, who will talk about global land cover monitoring and updating big data challenges. Thank you. Yes, so I'm Dainus Masilunas, and uh, I'm from Wageningen University and Research, and uh, I will be talking quite a bit about a project that I'm involved with, which is the Copernicus Global Land Services. And uh, this project is led by Vito, an institute in Belgium, and uh, we collaborate quite closely on that one. So, about land cover. Land cover is a very important variable, uh, as posted by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals because it is something that a lot of users need. So the governments need to know what kind of land cover we have, whether it's trees, grass, water, urban, and so on, in order to be able to set effective policy. Landowners want to know what is present on their own land and how it is changing over time. And if we know land cover change, then we can monitor both the current situation better, as well as predict future changes and then adapt the policy uh, to that. And nowadays we can do it globally thanks to uh, satellite imagery time series. And uh, if we want to make monitoring effective, we need to make use of those time series in order to do updated land cover maps. And the Copernicus Global Land Services land cover project is specifically made to make use of that. So the aim of the project is to have a land cover map that is updated yearly and uh, that has both discrete classes, which is the traditional way of doing land cover mapping, as well as continuous covers, which is basically the fraction of every land cover class that we have in every pixel. Uh, and what we have right now is, in fact, the discrete classes and the continuous covers for the year 2015 globally at 100 meter resolution. You can see the link over here. You can just access the map there and uh, explore. Our aim is to have the yearly updated maps, and this is something that we are currently working on. And uh, specifically, my contribution to the project is twofold. So one is the land cover fraction mapping methods themselves, and uh, then change detection for yearly map updating. So this is an overview of the processing chain that we have in the project. So everything starts actually by collecting some training data, and that's done using the GeoWiki platform. And GeoWiki allows people to collect the data themselves, so any regular citizen can do that as well. Whereas in the project, uh, we're asking regional experts to do the collection, and then all of the points are validated also by our central experts. Uh, once we have the training and validation points, then uh, we use Python and SCKit uh, Learn to train um, models to uh, predict the land cover. And this is done on Vito's uh, infrastructure. So there's a cluster called Terrascope, which is running Apache Spark. And uh, we can use Hue and Elasticsearch to also keep track of all of the processes there. And then, of course, GDAL is used to convert between different types and to do it efficiently. Now, for the reference data, we have so far 150,000 or over that uh, points over the whole globe, which all have information about the fractions of a 100 by 100 meter uh, area. For validation, we have over 21,000 points also globally, and these two data sets are collected by two separate teams. So we know that uh, the validation set is completely independent. And we also have a lot of uh, big data challenges. So if we want to do global mapping, we can only use global data sets in order to predict the land cover maps. If it's not global, then we have missing values and our classifier will not be happy about that. And also, the time series is very important because we can make use of that both to update land cover maps as well as to actually tell what kind of land cover there is on the ground. Um, and we also plan to upscale from 100 meters to 20 meters in the future, which is also quite complicated with big data because we have a big multidimensionality issue. We have of course, your X and Y coordinates, but we also have the time steps because of the time series. 
and we also have the bands of the satellite, then the vegetation is that we can calculate from that, as well as the external covariates that allow us to predict land cover better. So I'll delve a bit deeper into the two parts that I'm working on specifically. So one is the land cover fraction mapping, and here you can see the uh, cover layers that are uh, already provided for the year 2015. As you can see, we can visualize shrubs, trees, and grasses in one map by uh, having RGB mapped into those classes. And basically, in order to predict the uh, class fractions, uh, we need to use regression techniques. And uh, the regression techniques require some model input. So for the input, we use the ProboV satellite archive, the entire archive from 2014 when the satellite was launched up until today, which is around 400 images. Uh, from the satellite, we get four bands, green, red, near infrared, and short wave infrared. Out of that, we calculate five vegetation instances, NDVI, EVI, NDMI, NERVI, and OSAVI. And then we also have over 300 covariates. So they're quite diverse. We use spectral data, like time series, composites, and so on. We use Terran data, such as uh, slope, elevation, roughness, and so on. Uh, climate data, so that's also time series, it's temperature per month, as well as precipitation, and so on. As well as some soil data, like soil organic carbon, bulk density, and other metrics. Then to process all of this data, we need to have enough processing power, so we're using the Terrascope cluster. So by default, it gives a regular virtual machine, just four cores, eight gigabytes of RAM, one terabyte hard disk drive, with actually that's actually sent to us 7.4. Uh, and the nice thing about it is actually that uh, it has an NFS access to the level three top of canopy data of the ProV satellite, and uh, that allows us to pretty easily access all of the data, the entire archive. And not only that, but also uh, it has an Apache Spark cluster, which also has this direct access to the same data. So we can process it on the cluster quite easily. However, some data is not there, like the digital elevation model or the climate data, so we need to download that ourselves. And actually, even though it's easy access, it is still going over the network. So if we want to extract a point, out of 385, uh, 86 files, we need to actually access all of those files from the file system just to get to that one point time series. So it actually takes a lot of time for the amount of points that I'm extracting, which is about half a million. And I tried to do that using GDAL with Bash, and also I tried to do the same thing with Python and GDAL, and it doesn't really change that much. It still takes over a month to actually extract the whole thing, and we're thinking that uh, it might be a bit more optimal to do extraction not from the flat files in the disk, but rather from a database. Uh, so maybe we will try to see whether the OpenEO project can help us with that to extract the data more efficiently. That's for the future. Um, then we also have uh, six machine learning algorithms that uh, we tested. So. Uh, fuzzy near centroid, logistic regression, lasso regression, partial least squares, random forest, and also artificial neural networks, specifically the multilayer perceptron. All of these uh, um, algorithms are implemented in R. Keras is interesting because it's actually a binding to Python Keras package, and uh, the Python package is interfacing with a backend that's TensorFlow. And TensorFlow in itself can also make use of GPU computations to uh, accelerate the training process. So I'm also using a GPU for that. Although, as you will see later, it doesn't give as good results as Random Forest does. I'm also considering to add support vector machines as well as uh, spe uh, spectral mixture analysis to see if those could do better but here are my preliminary results. These are just the results over Africa, so not yet the whole globe. Um, and we see so far that uh, Random Forest is doing the best job. It is most accurate. Uh, and we can also optimize it slightly. 
So we can make two models. We can make one model that is specifically for predicting zeros and another model for predicting all the non-zeros. That is because we have a lot of zeros in fractional mapping because for any given area in the world, chances are that uh, any given Langkower class is going to be a zero because usually it's only like three Langkower classes that can be mixed and in a lot of cases you also just have pure pixels. For example, water. That's just water and everything else is zero. Uh, so that does help to decrease uh, mean absolute error, but it does increase RMSC because we have more errors for the classification of zero to non-zero because that's a separate model. Uh, and also, if we're scaling this from Africa to the whole globe, we also run into this issue that uh, we cannot use regular uh, CSV files, for example, to uh, keep all our data, we need to have databases. So I'm now moving from CSVs to GeoPackage, which is a database in and of itself. And then if we look at uh, some statistics from the model, we see that the most difficult uh, class to classify is grasslands, and the easiest ones are all of the um, the non-vegetation classes, so urban, bear, water. And we also have a bit of a bias in the classifier in that it tends to overestimate shrubs and underestimate a lot of the other classes. It could also have something to do with the input data because, once again, we have a completely independent validation sets collected by different people. And looking at uh, the variable importance, we can see that actually a lot of these uh, covariates are important. The least important ones are terrain and location. But uh, for a lot of these classes, really a lot of data is important. So for example, uh, the harmonic covariates are most important for crops because crops oftentimes have a double uh, season for the cropping. And we can also see that, for example, the soil information is very important for water which is quite interesting because actually it's not so much because there's some interesting soil information over water, but rather because there is no soil information over water. So the classifier can quite easily detect whether this is water or not. <laughs> All right, and then the second part of what I'm doing is the uh, land cover map updating. So uh, we can, of course, make use of the same model to predict the land cover map for the next year. The problem with that is that just a small change in your inputs is going to have a really big change for the outputs, and we get a lot of spurious change. So uh, what we do is, for one, apply expert rules. So which transitions are possible or likely? So for example, in this case, you can see an example of a relatively unlikely transition from urban to water. Usually those transitions are temporary and don't really count as length or change, because in this case, it's just flooding. Um, so we can quite safely say that this is not likely to happen, unless we have really good reasons to believe that this does happen. But also we use time series break detection to constrain which pixels are changed and which ones are not. Uh, with that, we needed to figure out which break detection algorithm to use and which vegetation index, and that's still an ongoing work. So we chose to use the BFAST algorithm, uh, which works by decomposing the time series of a vegetation index into seasonal trend and remainder components, and then those components are subdivided into these small segments, uh, which don't have change within the segments. And we determine that by the Bayesian information criterion. And then basically the boundaries between these segments count as breaks. So you can see here a time series, it is segmented into these four different segments, and the breaks are basically what is in between those segments. And uh, basically I'm running all of this computation on modus derived vegetation indexes from 2007 onwards to the present. And of course, uh, this is also run on the Apache Spark cluster on Terrascope. <clears throat> the nice thing about it is that it provides a uh, about 1,200 cores, which is quite a bit. And uh, the way that I'm uh, using it is that I use the modus tiles, so the entire time series, and I split it into around 2,000 chunks uh, using GDL build VRT. So it can be used not just for mosaicing, but also for cropping, which is quite convenient. And then VFast itself is an actual algorithm that is implemented in R. So I'm using Spark R to send all of these 
uh, chunks to the processors. And uh, then the um, result afterwards is mosaic back into one tile uh, locally on just the virtual machine because mosaicing does not really cause that much time. S and after we have all of the mosaics for every tile that we have, we also do a global mosaic once again with GDL build VRT. So we use that for both cropping and in the end for the mosaicing of the globe. And so we can detect changes using our algorithms, but the question is how good can we do that? And uh, now we're collecting some change reference data so that we can tell whether our algorithms are performing well or not. And this is also done by the same institutes, Siasa and Wagningen. Uh, it is still a work in progress though. Um, we tested so far three different change detection algorithms. So BFAS that I explained, BFAS monitor, which is quite related, and T-test, which is very simple, and also three different vegetation units, so EVI, NDMI, and NRV. And generally, all of the algorithms that we saw overestimate change, uh, and they still need to be tuned because as we get more information about which is real change and which is not, we can tune the algorithms to perform better. Uh, and in the end, we will need to pair the classifier output also with the expert rules and the change detection so that we can reduce the serious change without uh, losing any of the areas that actually have change as well. And so in the future, we are still seeing a lot of big data challenges because uh, we will need to scale it down to 20 meter resolution from the 100 meter resolution that we have in Proba Fee. So we're going to use NL2 for that. And that's pretty much a 25 times increase in data volumes. And also we have, um, we have Landsat that we want to use instead of MODIS for the change detection because MODIS is 250 meter data and uh, we need to, uh, if we scale down to Sentinel-2 data, then 250 meter breaks is going to be not enough. So we need to move to Landsat instead. But that's actually an even bigger uh, increase in data volumes. That's a 70 times uh, increase in data volume. So we'll need to figure out how to scale our algorithms better as well. And then also on top of that, we are planning to use some Sentinel-1 data, uh, specifically the 20 meter resolution data for gap filling in the areas which are covered by clouds. So the optical sensors don't do a good enough job uh, in those areas. And then so with all that increase in data, a cluster, even though it's a really big cluster, it's still not going to be enough. Not just because of the processing power, but also the data which is not available there. So neither the Sentinel nor Lancet data is there. So currently we're considering where to move. So uh, we can try to do this on Google Earth Engine, but for example, BFAST is not really implemented yet on Google Earth Engine. Uh, we could also go for Amazon. We can check whether it's possible to do it on the DSs, but then perhaps Lancet data might be a problem in there. And uh, we also are working on optimizing the BFAS algorithm to run on GPUs to make it much faster as well. But then that would also require a cluster that has GPUs. And of course, still the data management problem persists. So yeah, that was basically the summary of my work. And uh, thank you for your attention. In case you have any questions, then please let me know. Is there a reason why you're running this project in Africa uh, first? Yes. So uh, Africa is our model uh, continent because it has land cover that is really difficult to classify. So we have really heterogeneous landscapes. And especially with the change, we have also a lot of these uh, interannual variability in Africa. So basically, if we can get Africa correctly, then scaling up to the rest of the world is going to be easier. We don't want to try something that is easy and then scale up and then see, oh, it doesn't actually work. <laughs> I'll come and talk to you afterwards. We run a project called Digital Earth Africa where we're preparing all of the data that you need for all of Africa. So hopefully <laughs> we can work and make your work easier. No, that sounds very nice. Thanks. Great. Uh, I, li 
Uh, I appreciate the fact that you talked a lot about seasonality and seasonal changes, and I'm kind of curious as to you know the ideas that you're going to offer uh, a yearly product. I think, well, what are you going to do for places uh, like you know the West African Sahel, where you have a very short growing season, and for nine months out of the year it looks bare, but is actually cropland. Yes, so we're not yet at the point where we can deal with that because indeed we are planning to do yearly maps and so far the idea is that we should map the type that is dominant throughout the year basically. So we can only represent one land cover class per year. Uh, but we will need to also double check indeed in those areas because indeed in that area specifically is also part of our um, model area and we do have a lot of issues with mapping the land cover there. Uh, our training data that I showed, actually I can go back to that, um, it does tell you that indeed it is cropland even though indeed it probably looks bare for most of the time. And hopefully the algorithms can also figure out that in this area, we have cropland that looks quite bare. <laughs> I think... Yeah, you can see here... Oh. You can see here that this area is also with croplands, a lot of it. And same from the validation data, there's croplands here. Um, so a question about the, the, cover <coughs> the covariances you're integrating into your methodology. Um, by going down to 20 meters, don't you expect that a lot of those uh, layers will not be usable anymore because it's not granular enough? And a related question is, if you're going down to 20 meters and you're going to have to change the methodology anyway, why not go down to 10 meters and leverage the highest resolution bands of Sentinel-2? Yes, so for Sentinel-2, um, I can also show this. So basically, if we upscale to 20 meters, Sentinel-2 has quite a lot of usable bands for that. At 10 meter resolution, it doesn't have as many, and we want to make use of not only the, um, the spatial resolution, but also the spectral resolution, because Prova V itself only has four bands, and we are really hitting the limits of what we can see out of that. And we're hoping that if we go to Sentinel-2, we can actually leverage this extra information. That's why we're going to 20 meters. And it's true also for fractional uh, cover mapping as well, that uh, at 20 meter resolution, we might have less of these mixed pixels. So then maybe we don't need to focus that much on the fractional mapping, and maybe it's more important than to do the classical uh, discrete classification. But on the other hand, it's something that we will still need to investigate in the future. And so far, we are just uh, trying to make sure that our um, workflow works on 100 meters as well as on the 20 meters. We have another team that is specifically working on the upscaling and making sure that it runs properly with the whole uh, processing chain that we have. And last question. Is there any questions? Um, the validation and training data that you used, is that open or is that... Um yes, yeah, so the validation data and the training data, they're uh, completely separate data sets. And uh, it's very important to us to ensure that if someone else wants to make use of the data, they don't just combine them because they're completely separate data sets. So we'll need to figure out a way to publish it. We want to publish it in the future, but first we need to make sure that the data is complete and that we also have a description for the data. So we need to publish a paper specifically on that to make sure that all the users know how to use it properly. So that's a work in progress. OK, thank you, Dainius. With this uh, talk, we conclude our slot. And if you have any question, you can ask him directly. Thank you very much.